spent a long time. You spent, to produce, say, a minute of speech, you would spend be many hours of work. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Forrest Moser invented and patented the first integrated circuit speech synthesizer in 1974. He licensed this technology to telesensory systems, which used it in the Speech Plus Talking Calculator. Later, National Semiconductor also licensed the technology used for its Digitalker speech synthesizer. In 1984, Moser founded Electronic Speech Systems to develop and market speech synthesis products. In 1994, Moser and his son Todd founded Sensory Circuits Incorporated, now called Sensory Incorporated, where they developed the RSC-164 Speech Recognition Integrated Circuit. Moser has 17 U.S. patents in the areas of speech synthesis and speech recognition. Electronic Speech Systems did the work to add digitized speech to several games for the Atari 8-bit and Commodore 64 computers. You can hear digitized speech created by ESS in the Atari versions of Kennedy Approach by Microprose. Airflex 303, heading 270, cleared for landing. 221B Baker Street by Datasoft. And Ghostbusters by Activision. Ghostbusters! The Atari versions of these games often had fewer spoken phrases than the Commodore 64 ports of the same games, probably due to the Atari's smaller amount of RAM and floppy disk capacity versus the C64. For instance, the Atari version of the Ghostbusters says the title. Ghostbusters! but leaves out, he slimed me. He slimed me. <laughs> Commodore Talking Games, thanks to ESS, also included, among others, Talking Teacher by iMagic, Solo Flight by Microprose, Friday the 13th by Domark, Desert Fox by Accolade, and Impossible Mission by Epix. <laughs> Thanks to Mark Keats for extensive background information for this interview. Keats has created a pair of interesting demos for the Atari in which he ported the Commodore 64 digitized speech from Ghostbusters and Impossible Mission to play on the Atari computers. Check the show notes at ataripodcast.com for those demos and links to several articles about Moser and electronic speech systems. This interview took place on September 14th, 2015. You are Professor Emeritus at uh, UC Berkeley, is that right? That is correct. Cool. And so, does that? What does that mean? Or do you still? Does that? Do you still go in and teach occasional classes, or? No, um, it's a slightly longer story, which I'll tell you. Is this was about you know I don't know how long ago, ten maybe fifteen years ago, mm-hmm. uh, during one of the budget crises at the university, uh, they offered early retirement programs to the faculty. Uh, and uh, I accepted that. It was very good uh, retirement terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one-third of the physics department, I'm in the physics department, one-third of the department retired. So they suddenly didn't have enough faculty for teaching courses or in in keeping research active. Mm -hmm. So they offered to call us all back with a fancy title that's called Professor in the Graduate School. So that's what I am, And, and as such, I have my choice to, for example, not be on department committees, but to teach if I wish or do research if I wish. Um, And I'm doing research. I have a a very active research group. What are you researching in now? Uh, It's space physics. Uh, I've always always been interested. My research has always been in space physics. The speech which we'll talk about was kind of an avocation for me. Hmm. Excellent. I, mean, I saw on your, your uh, Wikipedia, I said you, it's, you do pioneering work in the area of electrical field measurements and space plasma, which sounds very awesome in Star Trek, but I don't understand a word of it. Well, that's okay. Neither do I. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. So now that we've yeah, talked about well, that, that is my research. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And um, 
uh, can you give me a, a one minute explanation of, of what what you what that means in layman's terms? Sure. Um, in space, there are natural phenomena that cause the acceleration of charged particles, electrons and ions, to very, very high energies, relativistic energies, so that they're going at the speeds very close to the speed of light. And so, for example, um, the Van Allen radiation belts are populated by electrons that became accelerated by a mechanism that we're trying to understand. Uh, the aurora, if you've if you ever seen an aurora, you'll appreciate the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Same process. On the sun, there are these energetic solar flares that bombard spacecraft and disable them and destroy uh, uh, electrical circuit, electrical grids on the ground. Those are all the result of acceleration of electrons to uh, high, much higher energy than you would have thought if you didn't go out and measure them. And so the process of doing that, what is, the, what is it that's in the nature, what's in nature, what's in physics that causes that to happen? And that's what we're studying. Nice. Great. All right, so now that we've talked about what you're currently doing, uh, let's talk about what you used to do. <laughs> uh, well, I still try to do. Are oh, you still doing some speech stuff? Uh, not really. I'm on the board. Of, what happened is that a company, I started two plus companies and the last one uh, my son is now CEO and runs it and I go down there and to board meetings and and they think I offer wisdom which I don't <laughs> and what company is that that company's name is sensory sensory incorporated nice. so how did you get let's go way back to the beginning before the beginning tell me how you got started in computers uh, how you got started in, in electronic speech and what drew you to it and uh, you know tell me the, the story before the story all right well the story is that I was uh, I'm interested in a variety of things and one of them at that or long long time ago was the process of speech generation and the speech recognition what is it that I do I I utter these noises and somehow you understand them uh, so what is what are the features in the noise I'm generating that that cause you to understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that was totally the motivation. I connected a microphone to an oscilloscope in my lab. Out of pure curiosity, you know, what does speech look like? And, uh, so I, and I was active in the lab building hardware for space flight. And one day I connected a microphone to an oscilloscope and noticed speech, uh, which had a lot of redundancies in it. And it occurred to me that one could probably reduce, eliminate some of those redundancies uh, and still have pretty good quality speech. So I started fooling around with no real goal in mind, mm -hmm. ended up, uh, fig well, let me go off to a, a side comment here first. The interest in speech recognition in those days, and still is, uh, is compression of the information content. So the idea if, if I just record a speech waveform and try to put it into a memory that existed 30 years ago, it you know would accept a couple seconds of speech and fill the memory. Mm -hmm. So the whole object at, of the commercial interest in speech recognition was compression of the information content so you could put a lot of speech into what in those days was a very, very small memory uh, and still be able to say a lot of things electronically. Well, I didn't really appreciate the, that, and I really didn't have a commercial motivation when I got started, but I could see all, a lot of ways that you could compress the information content in speech, uh, and I worked through all these ways and was able to compress the information content in speech by about a factor of 100, which meant that in the small memories that existed in those days, instead of being able to store a couple seconds of speech, you could store a couple hundred seconds of speech, and I realized that became, that's a commercial product at that point. Uh, and one other thing to mention along these lines, in those days, microprocessors had no capability. So uh, the standard technique in research labs that were doing speech, speech recognition, speech analyses, uh, was to use uh, complicated mathematical techniques that you couldn't ex execute in real time on 
on these little teeny microprocessors that existed in those days. Mm -hmm. So one of the benefits of my technology at that time was that uh, it did, took almost no computing effort to reconstruct the speech from the compressed data. Mm -hmm. So I had for a period of time a very different kind of speech synthesis technology than the conventional technology uh, that existed at that time. And my technology had the benefit that you could actually put it into uh, the dinky little microprocessors and memories that existed in those days and produce uh, the order of, you know, of a minute or minutes of speech in a product. And when I realized that, I filed a patent application, went out and tried to license my technology. Nice. So it sounds like with your technology, encoding speech was expensive in terms of CPU time, but decoding it was very cheap. That's exactly right. So uh, there, m myself and a lot of people that I trained, I don't know how many altogether, half a dozen people, spent a long time. You spent, to produce, say, a minute of speech, you would spend, you know, I, I have to think about it, but it would be many hours of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was where the effort was. But once you had done it, you could actually store it in the, the dinky little uh, computer stuff that existed in those days and synthesize, synthesize it with the little microprocessors mm -hmm. that exist. So nice. um, it was a good technology for a while, but you know what happened? Moore's Law caused memories to get big and, micro, and computer microprocessors to get powerful, so that obsoleted that technology. Sure. What year are we talking here when you were first doing these experiments? Oh, I would have to look that up, so let me make a good guess. 19, it was the early 70s, I think. All right. I'd have to look that up. No, I just wanted sure. kind of a, you know, a, a, a kind of a place uh, to where we where we were. So. I think I think that's when it was seven. Yeah, it had to be early seventies, I believe. So you had these patents. Is that when you decided to found electronic speech systems? Um, no, there. That's there's a process that got me to that. Okay. Uh, the first thing I did um, was license a company called Telesensory uh, Systems, Telesensory. Mm -hmm. uh, they made aids to the handicapped. Uh, and uh, it, it happened, this is a coincidence that some people have turned into a logical sequence, but it's not. It happened that I had a blind graduate student at that time who became the first uh, blind PhD physicist in the United States. And he was working with me in my research at the university on space physics, not on, on speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had connections with this company, Telesensory Systems, uh, because they made aids for the blind. Uh, and he was really a brilliant guy. Uh, and he would test all their, their equipment. So he had connections with them. And when I t we talked about, you know, I'm fooling around with speech, he said, boy, you can make a talking calculator for the blind. And I went down, talked with them, and we did some testing together. And eventually they signed a license and produced what I believe is the very first talking commercial product ever made. It was a calculator for the blind. Wow. And so that's how it started. I had a license agreement with them. And mm -hmm. the... Uh, and they sold that technology to other companies, uh, uh, again, with under, under agreement with my licensing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, they had a period of exclusivity that was a couple of years. I don't remember how much, maybe two years. Uh, at the end of which, I licensed National Semiconductor, who made a chip called the DigiTalker, uh, it wasn't very successful. Uh, How come? I, I, I'm almost, I almost started to tell you why, but I don't think I want to. It's <laughs> not, a, not a pleasant story. National really didn't uh, have the understanding to pursue uh, the commercial app, uh, applications of that, uh, that speech synthesizer chip, so it, it never really took off. Mm. And uh, when I realized that... Uh, that's when I started electronic speech systems. Uh, so that came along too. I I can't. I don't. I don't know the years of any of these things, but that had to be 
two, three, five years or something after I first licensed the telesensory. Hmm. When, when I think of the first speech product that I knew as a child, and uh, what, it was um, T.I.'s uh, Speak and Spell. Was, Speak and Spell was the competitive product. That was uh, Texas Instruments. Right. Put that okay. product. All right. We're, we hate those guys. Then. We're not going to talk about that anymore. <laughs> Well, I, I did at the time, but they, they were uh, they were an interesting competitor. The reason I actually signed up with National Semiconductor after an awful lot of negotiating and fooling around and indecision on their part uh, was the day that Texas Instruments announced Speak and Spell. It is the next day or two is when I licensed National, hmm. who was their competitor and wanted to have a competitive product. So what other pro- speak and spell was much more widely uh, used, much more widely purchased than anything that National ever produced. Hmm. So what else did they come out with um, besides the the talking calculator? Na- national, are you asking? Yes, National. Um, I can't remember. There were some products, but they were they were more or less test like products there was no there was no major selling product that national ever sold those chips into okay uh there's an interesting side story the uh concerning national and concerning do you know a man named masayoshi son i don't know that name no uh he's the founder of softbank and at one point was the richest man in the world and was a was, was a student at but this is a side story it was a he was a student at Berkeley in economics, and uh, he came to see me at one point uh, to ask me to help him build a speech synthesizer because he he was not a, an engineer or anything, but he had the idea that you could uh, make speech uh, tr- translators that uh, that uh, you would put in kiosks at airports, and mm-hmm. so you'd go into you know Spain, for example. And you type in a word in English, and it would pronounce it in Spanish. So you could learn a few words in any country that way. So that that was his business idea when he was an undergraduate student at Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I helped him build a demo, and he took it to Japan. He actually licensed Sharp. And uh, then on his own, this, this was at the same time that I had in parallel a license with National Semiconductor, uh, and he decided that he was going to sell national semiconductor chips uh, in Japan and did it with and without any authorization or approval from national and without any pricing or anything uh, and he did he's uh, he was in Japan for a couple weeks and uh, life has sold uh, you know, I don't remember number three or four different major companies that technology and mm-hmm. national got upset when this little undergraduate kid from the university uh, was out selling their their team that was in Japan. That they they got into an argument and got this all his sales canceled. And National never ever did sell speech technology to anyone in Japan uh, then or afterwards. Wow. So I don't think uh, I I can't remember any product. Any significant product that had Nationals DigiTalker in it. All right, so they're not doing a good job. So you started Electronic Speech Systems so that you could do it better yourself. It sounds like. Hello. Hello, are you there? I'm here. I lost you. Now no, I- no, I thought I lost you. So every once in a while, uh, you you kind of. Hmm. Uh, I kind of lose you, but we're together again. Should I hang up and call back, do you think? Are you speaking? I don't hear anything. Maybe I should hang up and call you right back. Uh, Why don't you do that? I think their connection's bad. We'll try again. Okay, Okay. I'll hang up. Okay. Hello? Hello. Is this any better? Hello. Hi, I'm here. All right. Well, I I heard you say hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can hear you great, ironically. So, um, I, what? Sh- no, you're you're still breaking up. Huh. Uh, 
All right, well. Are you talking now? I just don't hear anything. Okay, I'm going to try to ask you questions, and I can hear you fine, so I'm just going to, I'll repeat my questions if I need to. So tell me about when you started electronics. Well, what I hear is banging in the background. Huh. All right. Uh, well, let's let's keep trying. If you, you know, I'm going to make you repeat everything three times, but maybe we can make it work. Okay, I can edit later. So, so it sounds like National wasn't doing their job, so that's why you started Electronic Speech Systems. You're correct that National really wasn't selling anything, and I didn't have any commitment. Any, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. You know, commitment just to National. It was I could license or do anything else I wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. And I decided that the thing to do would just be to have my own uh, little dedicated chip, which was really just a little microprocessor for doing speech synthesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found uh, uh, a guy and his wife. His name was Fred Chan. And his wife, name I can't remember, she was the brains. Uh, and I hired them to design a chip, and we became friendly and eventually, uh, he joined. I hired him to join my company, and I uh, I had fun designing, uh, you know, th designing the technology. And I didn't really want to run a business. I wanted to be a physicist at the University of California. Mm -hmm. So I eventually hired Fred Chan to be the operating officer for uh, my the speech synthesis company that I started. And we worked together as partners for a while, and um, the company was extremely successful. Uh, put uh, our chip in uh, in a lot of products and made money. Uh, and eventually, I decided that I really, I really didn't want to be involved in this kind of commercial enterprise to the extent I was. So I ended up selling the company uh, to Fred Chan, hmm. uh, and and he took he. Took the company over then. So it sounds like you you your interest started in speech recognition, but you ended up mostly doing speech synthesis. Uh, at that time, it was all speech synthesis because uh, you know I hadn't really thought about recognition, and again, recognition was a harder task than synthesis, mm -hmm. and and still required more computer power than was than existed at that time. So the company was entirely speech synthesis at that time. Uh, after I sold the company to Fred Chan, I started thinking why why you could do recognition. And meanwhile, microprocessor power was increasing. and uh, uh, So I developed a speech recognition technology, uh, and with that started a second company, which became uh, Sensory, hmm. which is a company called Sensory today. Uh, and that company uh, did both synthesis and recognition initially. Okay. So at some point you did some uh, speech for some video games um, for Atari and uh, for, I mean, arcade games as well as home computer games. So yeah, you know, that is correct. And, but, and I was, I've been having trouble trying to remember and reconstruct in my own mind exactly what I did do because some of that uh, was done by my licensees without very much of my own involvement. Uh, mm. What I remember for sure doing were, were video games for Commodore, uh, mm -hmm. for the Commodore 64 computer. And the one I remember and liked the most was called Ghostbusters. Uh, mm -hmm. But my technology was used by various people under under license or or by by my own company, uh, ESS Technology, to support uh, things like Atari video games. And I don't have a real distinct recollection of which games or what. I remember meeting Nolan Bushnell and spending time at Atari, but I really don't remember uh, any products that we made. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about what you do remember. Maybe I, maybe I can jog your memory a little bit. So talk to me about Ghostbusters. Have, tell me how that project came up or what you liked about it? Um, well, it was, well, it was, a, it was the Commodore game. And, and, and uh, I don't know if you remember the Ghostbuster movie. It was a very popular comedy kind of movie at that sure, time. Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so Commodore, uh, 
made a Ghostbuster version, uh, and it had a relatively large amount of speech in it. It was kind of a neat and fun game, uh, and that's why I enjoyed it. So I worked on that personally, developed the, did the hard work of develop, doing the compression for the, for the Commodore game. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that's why I remember it. Uh, mm-hmm. but it was it was at, at that time when the Commodore 64 came out. It was, I, as, as I recall, at any rate, maybe I'm prejudiced, but as I recall, it was the best uh, uh, computer game at the time with speech. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, I read an article. Maybe this will jog your memory. I'm going to read you a little something here. That was a, a, a web page from uh, someone who was developing games. And he said he was working on a game called Impossible Mission, which used digitized speech. He said the performances were provided by electronic speech systems, which also provided the software for use on the Commodore 64. I told them what I wanted the game to say, and then they asked me what kind of voice I had in mind. I said I was imagining a 50-ish English guy, like a James Bond villain. I was told they happened to have such a person on their staff, so instead of hiring an actor, they let him take a whack at it, and I thought it was just fine. I never met the guy who provided the voice, but to my knowledge, uh, the recordings were not altered or processed apart from being digitized. Well, Uh, that's interesting. That that jogs a little bit. So so electronic speech systems uh, did a lot of vocabularies for a lot of products, and... um, I was not so much interested in the production. I trained several people who became became able to do the compression. But everything mm-hmm. we ever did involved the tedious task of compression, including that English voice and uh, impossible mission. Mm-hmm. Nice. And That's they terrible. tended to be monotone. Uh, initially, everything was kind of monotone, robotic-like, and mm-hmm. I... So I spent my time trying to develop technology to uh, overcome that robotic nature, which that's the kind of thing I was doing uh, right. and succeeded in that at one time, at one point in time. Well, the, the things that we've talked about so far, as, as far as I understand, are actual digitized speech. Did you also work in, uh, I don't know what the other term is, just being able to say any arbitrary phrase? No, that, that's text-to-speech uh, mm-hmm. to a very limited extent, but the quality was so bad I didn't like to work on it at the time. <laughs> so, yeah, so that almost everything we did was uh, essentially predetermined phrases. Someone mm-hmm. would tell us what phrase they want, and then we would record that phrase uh, and then compress the data in that recording by a factor of 100 or so, and that was the end product. But we did do some stuff that that came out sounding like speech if you were broad-minded. <laughs> I read a book uh, not too long ago about speech on, I think it was uh, the, the Coco, the, the TRS-80 color computer. And so, and I, I don't really know much about speech, so I'm just going to throw this story out and see if, if it jogs memory or maybe you have something just to say about it. The book said that when they were digitizing speech, um, most everything took up a small amount of space, except for S sounds, which took up a huge amount of space, getting the, the uh, just the S sounds. Those are called fricatives. So, yes, F-R-I-C-A, fr- fricative. fricative. That's so like fr- F and F and T-H mm-hmm. and et cetera. Okay. So the fricatives were using... Uh, a lot of space. So then they discovered that if they went to a completely synthesized um, uh, static sound, which the chip could do very easily, they, they switched away from digitized speech and switched to a synthesized static for those moments when they needed the fricative. It saved all this space. And so anyway, they were switching in and out between digitized and, and uh, manufactured sounds. We did space. not do that because I also um, figured out a way to compress fricatives, not as completely, not as well as uh, the vowels and consonants. But um, we never, we never did that. Uh, it was always every every product we ever did.
started off as being a recording of speech. Mm -hmm. So that was, the, can you tell me about some other challenge that was, I don't know, tell me a story. Tell me a story about, a, about uh, well, digitizing the uh, speech. Here, oh, here's here's one of interest. Uh, we we put the first talking elevator in the world. Uh, in, in you know nowadays elevators speak to you and mm -hmm. uh, everything speaks to you. But the very first one of those was in the uh, in Washington D.C. in the department, and I forget the name of the department that's aids to the handicapped. Uh, uh, department, I don't know, Health and Human Services or whatever it is. I'm not sure it was that name. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they contracted to have us put an announcement in their elevator that announced floors. Uh, and I was in Washington for other reasons once and went over to their building and rode that elevator up and down for, I think, a couple hours and t listened to the reactions of people that <laughs> <laughs> I got a big kick out of that. Uh, another thing that just came to mind, this is what National did. National was making, National Semiconductor was making uh, checkout counters in uh, grocery stores, you know, the uh, the, the machines the, uh, that towed up your, the sum of your charges and mm -hmm. ran a cash register and, and monitored, among other things, monitored inventory and everything. And they put speech into that. Uh, and I thought that would really be a good product, but what it turned out that people don't really care about uh you know each individual item when they buy something so uh most places that you know I went down to one of the stores that installed eight of these things in their checkout lines and you know just to look at the public reaction and mostly it was ignored or disliked uh, so mostly they turned them off, uh, which surprised me I thought you know i it thought people would like to know how much they're paying for each item when they're buying, but it turns out that's not true. <laughs> it's not even true for me, by the way. I now, you know, when I go shopping, I don't really pay very much attention to the individual cost of each item. Yeah, I think most people probably don't until they get home and they look at the receipt and then they're, ah, oh, they overcharge right. me. And yeah. That's, that's a little bit, that's correct. But certainly in the store, it was, that was a, a big flop that we thought would be a big success at the time because National had a big division selling these checkout counters at, at grocery stores. I thought that would be a major use. It, it died. Hmm. Um, so I'm an Atari guy, and I know you you were you specifically remember doing Commodore games, but I know that your voice was used in some Atari games. Um, do you think that that was done? Did, did you guys? provide the the software to do that? Do you think a third party took care of that? Do you have no, any memory? I, well, I, I can't speak, I can't be positive, but what I'm 95% sure is that that was done by electronic speech systems, and I wasn't directly involved in a day-to-day -day way with that, but I'm rather sure that uh, our company, Electronic Speech System, put speech into Atari uh, games. There was one there's one game I'm trying to remember. Was there a game called Adam or something like that? I don't remember a game called Adam. I don't see that on the list. Um, what, do you see a list of games that had beat? I do. I have a, a list of games um, for Commodore and Atari. There's one called Kipling's Jum Jungle Book by Fisher Price, Kennedy Approach, which was a, uh, a air traffic control game by Microprose. Well, Solo I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, so I, I, my my belief is that all of those things were created uh, after I had formed Electronic Speech System and wasn't involved in day-to-day -day mm -hmm. compression of speech anymore. So uh, I think I, for, you know, I don't have clear memories of those things. The Commodore game I have a distinct memory of because I wanted to do that myself. The Ghostbusters? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, let's see, Solo Flight, which is a flying game by Microprose, Ghostbusters, which we talked about. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I remember Microprose as a, as a game, and I know our company did it, and beyond that, I don't have any recollection. Okay. Uh, Jump Jet, Impossible Mission, Talking Teacher, Cave of the Word Wizard. Cave of uh, the Word Wizard, I remember. Was that Commodore? 
That was a Commodore game, I think, yeah. Yeah, that was a nice game. Yeah, I remember that. I, I must have done that because I remember it. <laughs> um, 21B Baker Street, which that I think I is something to do with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Time Zero, Desert Fox. Desert Friday Fox, the... I vaguely recall. Who did Desert Fox? A, a company called Accolade. I, I don't remember the company, but I think I remember the product. I think what you're describing uh, are things that, that my our country a company, Electronic Speech Systems, did, but that I wasn't directly involved in the in the compression and synthesis of the speech. Sure. And then the last two I have here are Friday the 13th. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Is that what based on the, the the scary movie? I assume. Yeah, yeah, it was. The details I don't remember about that, but yeah, I do remember that that existed. Yeah, and so those, yeah. uh, what, do you have the years, the dates on, on, of those games? Were those nineteen uh, eighty? Uh, yeah, I mean those are all early, early eighties, probably eighty six at latest. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be my com- the company Electronic Speech Systems that did all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, the Atari systems had a little bit less accessible accessible memory than the Commodore 64 and smaller floppy drives. So the, there tended to be less speech um, on the Atari versions, which, of course, upset all the Atari people back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, oh, did the was wondering if you ever did anything in, in, in languages other than English and if, if your technology... Uh, lent, lent itself, was there any special considerations for doing something in Spanish or French or anything? anything no, uh, no, there wasn't. Uh, the, you know, there are languages that would be difficult. There's the uh, African language that involves clicks. I forget what it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, languages that are uh, like that would be, we never tried to do and never did. But um, any of the Western European languages, uh, we did several products. Uh, I, I speak French rather well. I lived in France for three years, and mm-hmm. uh, I remember doing some French vocabularies in detail. I can't remember what they were anymore. But, yeah, no, the technology, uh, which consisted of, a, of half a dozen different techniques for compressing the information content, uh, mm-hmm. that technology worked in any language. Do you remember any any real world applications that uh, used other languages? Well, uh, yeah, sure. Our talking calculator uh, that was built originally by this company, Telesensory Systems, uh, we did that in uh, at least four languages: at least Spanish, French, English, and I think one more. And at one point, and, and these were you you could buy a the the calculator in a given language, but not in two different languages. So at one point in time, I took one of these apart and added a little bit of my own electronics, and so it was a quadrilingual talking calculator. And so I could flip a switch on it, and it would talk French, or I could flip a switch and it would talk Spanish. But that was the kind of toy that I made for my own amusement. But the company uh, did sell to the handicapped, to the blind in France and Spain, and I'm sure there was a fourth country, a third country that I can't remember what it could have been. Uh, it must have, maybe it was German. I can't remember. But, yeah, no, it worked equally well in any language. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. every once in a while I look on eBay to, to look up talking calculators, uh-huh. and I bought it. Every once in a while I find... That original old telesensory talking calculator, and and I buy them when I can find them, just just for memory's sake. Uh, but if, if you feel encouraged someday, look on eBay and click on talking calculators and look for telesensory. There's a there was other talking calculators made with the same technology that was licensed by telesensory called Ultimos, U L T M O S D. I think something like that, and. You can buy those on eBay, and they work, and they're not expensive uh, because you know I think I think they're valuable, so I buy them. But they're cheap. I think I pay twenty or twenty-five dollars for one. Oh, cool.
the people pro- people selling them to you probably have no idea that they're selling them to the guy. Back yeah, to the that's guy right. Well, I don't want to say, hey, that's cheap. I'm the inventor, and then the <laughs> price will go up. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, but I have one. Or, I don't know. It's right around me within 10 feet, but I can't see. I don't see it. Hmm. Uh, if If you want, I'll turn it on, and you can listen to a little bit over the phone. Yes, please. I'd love that. All right. Hang on. I've got to find it. It's the hard part of the task. Okay, so the battery seems to be working. So I'm going to punch in some numbers and do a multiplication. You see if you can hear. Do you have any numbers you'd like to have multiplied? Clear. Four, seven, point, five, two, times seven, point, three, six, equals three, four, nine, point, seven, four, seven, could you hear any of that? Yeah, that was great. I could hear every word. Good. Nice. Yeah, and it, and it's, it, it still surprises me. It's monotone and not beautiful, but, but quite unintelligible, quite intelligible. Very nice. Did uh, was electronic speech systems? Was it? Did you have to keep an eye on what? the competition in the computer space was doing? For instance, there was a, uh, a product called well, Software Automatic Mouse. You know. now, at, the, at, at the time, there was a narrow window when our technology was the world leader because the microprocessors and memory sizes hadn't caught up with the more conventional techniques. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that narrow window, we really didn't have competition. And it was a good place to be. Because we sold LSI chips with our technology built into the chip, mm-hmm. and they were manufactured by a uh, foundry in China. Uh, and uh, we could, the, the company never needed to raise money because we could always ask for something like 50% down at the signing of a contract, and then use that to. Uh, you know, pay for the for the compression of the speech and the and the uh, development of the uh, silicon, uh, and and then when we deliver the the other half is profit. So the company was quite profit. It was an unusual company. It was quite profitable uh, uh, for again for a period of time with and without needing uh, capitalization to get started. So we never raised money outside. Nice. And over a period of I don't know maybe four or five years, there really wasn't competition for the technology. Nice. But then, I mean, later there was all sorts of competition. Oh, there was of course, a yeah. Well, company and, called and, Covox and, and a bunch of computer stuff. Gadgets. Sure, and and the technology quickly, uh, surp- you know, the the capabilities of the electronics. Uh, Built to the point where uh, the the more conventional technologies that people were studying in in research laboratories could start to be implemented on microprocessors um, that had enough memory, and you know that just put us out of business. Yeah. Yeah. What haven't I asked you yet that I should have? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I, I find the story of this guy Masayoshi's son to be intriguing, but uh, uh, that's not what you're talking about, and, and that's <laughs> published in a lot of. That's that's. I've I've talked to at least a half a dozen writers who have written about his, his life, and 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 he started by working with me in my lab, but that's a that's quite a different story. That's a story about a, a remarkable young entrepreneur. No, I haven't heard of him. I will have to uh, do some Well, what you can do, do you, you have a Kindle? Sure. Uh, for $4.50, you can buy a book from Amazon that you play on your Kindle or look at on your Kindle, mm-hmm. and it's called... Uh, well, what you have to do, you can just type in his name. It's Masayoshi, M-A-S-A-Y-O-S-H-I. Okay. First name, last name is Sun, S-O-N, uh, and he's Korean, and so his Korean name is Chung, and so I knew him as Chung Sun, but when he became 
uh, he be, he became by far the biggest, uh, you know, the the uh, the Bill Gates of Japan by far, and was richer than Bill Gates for a period of time. When in the course of doing getting there, uh, he just he changed his name from Chung Sun to Masayoshi because uh, there's prejudice against Koreans in Japan. Uh, but it's an, an it's an intriguing story of what he did. Aiming High, a biography of Masayoshi's son. I see it here. That's it. Yeah, that's the name of it. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Um, looking through my list here. So there's here. a little bit of a story. I mean, I'm involved in that story because, uh, and some of that could turn out to be useful to what you're doing. I'm not sure, but there's a story about. Uh, how he came to see me and how we went to Japan together and how he licensed Sharp and et cetera. And that's how he started uh, started uh, his way to becoming a super billionaire. Nice. Good for him. I think that's all the questions I have for you right now, unless there's something else speech-related you think I need to know. No, I can't. I'm I'm happy to talk with you because you're reminding me of things I used to know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. If you want to, if you want to talk again, I'm happy to talk with you, and I hope to hear from you. And as this thing develops, and listen to the product of your work. Great. Yeah, I will let you know when it's published, uh, probably next month. So. Okay. Good. Thank you a Thanks. lot. Thank you so much for your time, Forrest. Sure. Goodbye. Mission accomplished. Congratulations. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.